Experience Action Let's stop just talking about customer experience, employee experience, and the experience of leaders. Let's turn ideas into action. Your host, Jeannie Walters, is an award-winning customer experience expert, international keynote speaker, and founder of Experience Investigators, a strategic consulting firm helping companies increase sales and customer retention through elevated customer experiences. Ready, set, action. One, two, three. Hey everybody, so excited you're back. So excited that we have another question. And I bet this is one that a lot of you have been thinking about. So listen up. Hello, Jeannie. My organization is looking at starting focus groups or other avenues to bring in more of the customer experience perspective. What are your recommendations on getting started? How do we decide who to include? What other things should we consider? I would love to hear your feedback. Thanks, Kim. I love this question because you know what? We are always looking for ways to gather real-time information, important insights from our customers. And a lot of us are very familiar with focus groups. So when we think about focus groups, the traditional focus groups, as they are, you know, with usually the one-way mirror and people sitting there, with a facilitator getting asked questions, maybe being shown some videos or samples of things. In web design, sometimes we show wireframes and blueprints and things like that. Traditional focus groups like this have been a really popular method for gathering customer feedback for decades, frankly. However, I'm going to say something you might not like, and that's that this is not my favorite thing. Not my favorite. I have seen too many focus groups kind of go awry. So I want to go over some of the pros and cons of focus groups, as well as some alternatives or or maybe additional ways to gather that feedback that you're looking for. We can do this another way. So first of all, when we talk about focus groups, the reason that they're not my favorite, let's talk about that. They have several drawbacks that can limit their effectiveness. Yes, there are definitely pros to focus groups. Now, they allow for that real-time feedback that we're looking for from customers They provide an opportunity to observe, to watch customer behavior and even body language and tone of voice and all of those things that can tell us how somebody's really feeling. And they can be conducted uh, in person and get, you know, real time response to visuals and things like that. But otherwise, it's hard to really gather in that moment when they see something. So all of those are good things. Now they can be somewhat expensive to conduct because you need to often rent a specific space, you need to have certain equipment, you have to hire a facilitator, you have to recruit, all of those things. There's a lot of moving pieces. And frankly, they might not be representative of the broader population that you're trying to get to. I remember being recruited into a focus group when I was walking through a mall, right? Like I was walking through a mall and somebody said, hey, would you mind stepping in here? and reviewing these ads. Well, everybody who shopped in the mall was from the same neighborhood. We all looked pretty much the same. And I remember that vividly because even as uh, I think I was in my young teen years when that happened, I remember looking around thinking, um, wow, they really must want to know what girls like me think. But it was a random set of ads. And so I still look back on that and I wonder now as a customer experience professional, Was that intentional or was that not really intentional? Just who was at the mall at that time? And that can happen. So just be aware of that. And then, frankly, everybody shows up with our own biases, including facilitators. So even a very skilled facilitator can sometimes have bias that they are unaware of. Sometimes they are seeking an answer that they're being told to seek. So it kind of skews results that way. So nothing against facilitators. They do great work, but I think that sometimes we put them into positions that are challenging to get that real, authentic information and insights that we're looking for. So having said all of that, one of the things that I have actually liked more and more are virtual focus groups. But I'm not talking about the kind that kind of look like your traditional Zoom meeting where everybody sees each other and people just pipe up. I'm not talking about taking the in-person version and just sticking it online. Please explain. What I'm talking about are tools available in some of the more robust research or feedback tools that are out there 
that actually allow you to do things like present what somebody says and have it be voted up or down. So do people agree with it or not? And what happens is you start getting at what people are really agreeing about, what they feel strongly about, what they don't. There are just some really slick ways to do that now where it's not about the person who is the loudest. It's about really tapping into what are people feeling and thinking. So I like some of those options out there. Now, there are some other ways that I like to get that kind of feedback that we're looking for in slightly different ways. Now, some of these, I'm going to put a disclaimer right up front so all my market research friends understand. (laughs) There's a disclaimer. I mean, legal says we're completely covered. Some of these might not be as statistically significant as you want them to be. But most focus groups aren't either. Most focus groups are really about that qualitative, in some cases, anecdotal information that we're trying to get. You can do that in different ways. One that I like are customer interviews. These are one-on-one conversations with customers that allow you to gather detailed feedback on their experiences with your product or service. And this can be done in a variety of ways, right? We can We've done these in person. I had a client project where we were in an airport and we walked around and observed people and then pulled them aside and said, what did you think of that? You can do this by Zoom or video conferencing or even over a telephone. And there are so many ways to connect and really get at some of those things that we were talking about that are valuable about the focus group, like the body language, like really seeing things in real time. You can do that with customer interviews if you're creative and strategic about it. Just think outside the box here. So they are a great way to get in-depth insights into customer needs and preferences. And I have found that it doesn't take that many to get to those insights that you want. So you don't have to do dozens and dozens of interviews. Sometimes you just have to do a handful and you start realizing, you know what, this thing we thought was working, oh, it's not working. (laughs) And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that does happen. And that's the kind of feedback that we want, right? That's why we go to customers to begin with. Now, the other thing I'll say here is co-creation sessions are a great way to collaborate with customers and get that feedback that we're looking for. These are collaborative sessions where customers work with your team to develop new products or services or review the customer journey or build the customer journey with you, build the ideal state. All of those things can be done with customers and that can be really powerful and exciting. So co-creation sessions allow you to involve customers in that design process and ensure that whatever you're planning, whatever you're designing actually meets their needs. And then the last one is a bigger ask, right? It's a bigger investment of time, of resources, everything else. However, it's a long-term play and that's around a customer advisory board. So these are groups of customers who provide ongoing feedback and advice about your organization, your their experience, your products and services, you name it. Now, customer advisory boards can help you stay in touch with your customers and ensure that your products and services continue to meet their needs. All of these could be great ways to either supplement a focus group or even supplant it. I love alliteration, don't you? Anyway, so what I'm thinking here is that if you are committed to the focus group, If you have leadership who said, here's the money, here's the budget, we want a focus group. There are a few things, actually in any of these cases, whether it's customer interviews, whether it's co-creation sessions or customer advisory boards, whatever you do, do certain things in this order. Okay, that's my recommendation. Ready? Let's do this. Number one, we want to define the objectives. I have seen so many focus groups that are just kind of open. And we say like, what do you think? And what do you feel about this? And then at the end, you have all of this emotional data that you don't quite know what to do with because you didn't really go in there with a plan. So make sure that you have defined those objectives before conducting anything, before starting. It's important to define your research objectives and the questions you want to answer. This will help everybody stay focused during the session and make sure you get the most out of that time with your customers. And then at the end of the day, you need to report results. And so this will help you by defining the objectives and having everybody agree, these are the objectives. Then when you come back and say, here's how they answer the questions, 
When some executive says, hey, didn't we ask them if they liked the color blue? You can say, that was never part of our objectives. We did not ask that question and be proactive about setting those goals. I promise that will pay off later. The next thing I want you to think about is how do you recruit the right participants? Because you wanna make sure the participants in a focus group or a customer advisory board or whatever you have are representative of who you are trying to serve. Now, sometimes this means we have to go outside of our own customer base. If we are trying to get a new customer base or expand, we need to be creative about how we recruit here. So use that data um, to identify potential participants and then screen them. Make sure they are the type of people who will provide you the information that you want, that they're willing and able and authentic about what they do. So make sure you're recruiting the right way and screening the right way. Number three, prepare a discussion guide. A discussion guide is a list of questions or topics that you want to cover during the focus group. So it's important to prepare this in advance. You wanna get this approved. You wanna make sure that everybody in your organization who's involved understands that this is the discussion guide, that that will help you stay on track. This is what you will be covering. Don't let it get too long. I'm gonna say that again. Listen up. Don't let it get too long. You will want to put every question in there. You will have input from every leader in your organization saying, can't we ask them if they like our new logo? Can't we ask them if they would prefer if our next product had bells and whistles? Can't we ask them if they really appreciated their salesperson? Please be judicious with your customer's time here. Get to the point and let them have the space to tell you what they really think. Because if we're asking too many questions, you will not really get insights, you will just get some answers. Now, those are two different things. Let your customers have the space to tell you what they really think. And the only way we can do that is if we don't have a zillion questions, okay? Did I get that through? I hope so. I also want you to really hire a skilled facilitator. This is such a critical role in whatever you're doing. You wanna make sure that it runs smoothly, that they can respond to questions, that they can keep people on track. I used to joke about the fact that there's always one guy in these focus groups who just is there to hear himself talk. A skilled facilitator needs to understand that sometimes you need to find creative ways to get other people who aren't talking to participate in these things. When it comes to customer interviews and customer advisory boards, you want a facilitator who can really make everybody feel comfortable and welcome and valued for their time. So really look and be careful about who you put into that facilitator role. I will say, and this sounds self-serving, but I promise this is what I've seen. It can be very valuable to have a third party facilitator. If you have somebody inside the organization trying to run a focus group or trying to run a customer advisory board, there is no way to step out of that bias completely. We have roles that we play in our own organizations. We have goals that we're trying to achieve. We have bosses looking at us. So bringing in a third party is usually the way to go. Now, and I know that sounds self-serving, but I've just seen this work both ways. And I really believe that this is the way to go for you. So think about that as well. I really recommend recording the session when it's appropriate. And I say that because sometimes I actually recommend customer interviews are not recorded or shared with the organization. Now that is a little contrarian, I understand, but sometimes when we're talking about sensitive subjects or if it's a small customer base and there are real relationships at stake, sometimes customers are more willing to share if it's not being recorded and shared that way. Sometimes what we do is we interview a handful or a group of customers and we tell them, we're going to share this feedback at the macro level. We're not going to tell them who said it. And then we get a lot of really rich information that way. So as you do the interviewing or the focus groups, um, a lot of recommendations out there say record it no matter what. I would say consider the options there, okay? 
Um, and then finally, at the end of this, you want to analyze the data and make sure that you are identifying those key themes, insights, and even before that, identify what are the actions we're willing to take. Because if you get through customer interviews or a focus group or what have you, and you realize that, you know what, you, you've got all this great information about what needs to change, and yet nobody in the organization is willing to make the change. You don't have the buy-in you thought. Start there when you're defining your goals. Say, if we find X, are we willing to do Y? And then get everybody on board with that. So start from the beginning, have a plan, have a strategy, have a goal, and then take your time to get this right. Because having a focus group for focus group's sake, it really doesn't serve us in the way that people want it to. So I really hope that helps. I hope that you take advantage of some of these other ways to get that feedback and share what you learned. That's always so fascinating. So come back, leave me a voicemail. Let me know what you've learned. And uh, that doesn't go just for our caller. That goes for all of you listening. So don't forget, you can always leave me a question at speakpipe.com slash experience action. Or you can send me a note on LinkedIn or however you want to communicate. We are here for you. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep standing up for your customers. And I cannot wait to talk to you again next week. Thanks, everybody. To learn more about our strategic approach to experience, check out free resources at experienceinvestigators.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter, our Year of CX program, and more. And please follow me, Jeannie Walters, on LinkedIn. LinkedIn.